Coming up in this week in computer hardware, Samsung says their new phone screens are unbreakable. Is the GTX 1170 faster than a GTX 1080 Ti? Apple's got a patch for those overheating MacBooks, and Lenovo's smart display is pretty slick. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 476, recorded on July 26, 2018. Samsung's Unbreakable Phone Screens. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Casper, a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. You can save $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash twitch and by using the promo code twitch at checkout. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most delightful, most engaging, most affordable, most expensive, most outrageous, most ridiculous, most practical, and occasionally just flat out weirdest hardware news and reviews available in this or any known or unknown universe. I'm getting into the long part of the ridiculous opening. I'm Patrick Norton, joined today one time only, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Alan Melvintano from PC Per. One Recently time returned. Only. Is Europe? I'm just, I'm sort of half channeling the Blues Brothers, where where they get into the whole, you know, recently, uh, basically like you're back from a European tour. I'm trying to gotcha. do something clever, and I'm failing, and it's not. But you're back from. Did you spend six or eight weeks in Europe? Six. Wow. It was glorious. Like <laughs> it was glorious. It was a lot of fun. Need a vacation? Vacation now? Uh, it was. It was. It was overdue. Uh, by three or four years. Good. But it happened. It's good that you... It was glorious. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Favorite technological thing you saw on your vacation in Europe? Technological thing? Yeah. Like, they're, they're not... It's Europe. It's not... It's not super techie. Uh, <sighs> you know, there is some tech there, but it's like generally... Less, a little bit less techy, but uh, nice. what no, was your favorite saw, thing? You uh, favorite thing to see was uh, Lamborghini assembly. Really? Yeah. Wow. It's like they, it's all in it, one warehouse. Like they have two production drive? lines yeah. going. I didn't drive a Lamborghini. No, I would have. <laughs> I would have wrapped it around something. Uh, I did drive on the Nurburgring. That was cool, but it, it was raining. You said they had two production lines, like. Just normal production lines, or because I always envisioned like Lamborghinis being hand assembled in, in like giant velvet covered jewel box containers. It's it's <laughs> close. No, it's all it's like all in one warehouse. They have two huh? different like models being produced. So, but their their assembly lines are very short, and they're like long long stops. So they'll like sit in one place for half an hour, but then all the cars uh -huh. will shift over, and there's only like twenty or so steps. Fascinating, to, you know, to assemble it for, like front to back, but. There's one robot in the whole place, and its only job is to like bring the drivetrains to the cars. But everything is, it's all hand. Like in the back corner, there's like ladies stitching the interiors. Like it's no joke. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. I, yeah. yeah. Very nice. Also, yeah, very yeah. nice this week. Random story to lead with, just because I thought it was as a as an inveterate screen breaker. I just wanted to start with this one. Android Central uh, got the, has the write up. Samsung announces new unbreakable display that survives punishing UL certification. Quote, writes Andrew Martonic. This is the direction the industry is heading. And um, so Samsung this is a good direction to head. Absolutely. So uh, Samsung claims an unbreakable display. Uh, has UL uh, underwriter laboratory certification to go along with that. Um, so instead of trying to harden glass over the top of the screen, they've used a uh, substrate, a flexible OLED substrate, and uh, that is, quote, designed to not give out with repeated impact. Um, so it's, a, it's like a fortified plastic um, 
this is, uh, you know, basically they're using plastic instead of glass directly over uh, the panel and uh, the OLED panel, which is interesting. Um, they say the it's the transivity uh, or transmissivity, transmissivity. Yeah, I'm saying that right. Uh, basically, how well light gets through it and the hardness is very, very similar to glass, um, but it is much more flexible. So the UL testing uh, included uh, 26 successive four foot drops without damage. Uh, it also apparently continued working at extreme temperatures. Samsung Notes writes uh, Mr. Martonic that uh, <laughs> the panel was also tested for drops at six feet well above the current standard test, quote, without issue, unquote. So. Yeah, I'd be very interested to see how this uh, kind of material holds up against like just scratches on the surface because mm -hmm. that's the reason that you go harder on a display is you're, yeah. you know you're trying to be hard a harder surface than the things that might potentially rub up against them like your car keys and stuff like that. So I mean they're saying it's your similar. Change. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. If somehow they can if they can get similar to uh, you know to an actual glass surface, then that's that's going to be pretty dang good. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I want, I wonder like if the smartest way might not be to have like a kind of like a softer display, but then just have like some sort of an integrated, like almost like a screen protector, but just something that's replaceable, like a replaceable upper layer of the thing. Right. Cause you know, cause what you get now is the whole display is sort of like a, a, right. a, a more solid, like harder material. So that when it does crack, it's just all over. Right. It's just, it, you just have to replace the whole thing. I don't, um, I don't want to say what I'm about to say, but this is part of this is also the problem is, well, I, I said it like 32 times last week. It was kind of like the Greek chorus of this week in computer <laughs> hardware, which was, this is, you know, the problem is, uh, this is, this is the problem when you keep making things too thin. Um, if you click, there's a great picture. If you click through the link at the top of the Android central article to the Samsung press announcement where they're showing the actual screen yeah, yeah, and they're just like and, uh, they're just bending it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's it's definitely impressive that they can do that with that screen, and it's still working and everything. So, yeah, you know, they're saying kudos to them. Flexible OLED panel, unbreakable substrate, and an overlay window securely adhered to it. So, not a glass covered window, a uh, a fortified plastic window. Yeah, I I think yeah. I think you've got the big uh, I think you've got the big question. Uh, is 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 it going to scratch up? Are you going to have to polish your phone every couple of months like an old watch crystal? Um, and and honestly, that wouldn't be too bad either. Like I'd settle <laughs> for something that I'd settle for scratches that could be buffed out versus right. the only way to fix this is to replace it, right? Yeah. Like that's you know, yeah. I was yeah I was I was laughing, uh, you know. Uh, the the UL testing basically they were working off a mil spec uh, standard that which they don't name in the press announcements uh, like a U.S. Department of Defense standard, um, but they're really proud of that. You know, even in a subsequent 1.8 meter, nearly six feet drop test, significantly higher than U.S. military standard, Samsung displays unbreakable panel operated normally with no sign of damage. And I I shouldn't really mock because I'm actually pretty excited about this. Um, Given the number yeah. of screen protectors and screens I've broken, uh, I probably shouldn't make fun. Um, <laughs> from the uh, incredible rumors of rumors, or as, mm -hmm. uh, as I titled it in the rundown, GTX 1170 faster than 1080 Ti, at least in Poland. Um, short version is uh, WCCF Tech uh, found some benchmarks on a Polish website that basically say the GTX 1170 uh, alleged benchmarks of the GTX 1170 uh, makes it faster, scores it as being faster than the uh, 1080 Ti. So it's going to be a Turing-based part. Um, and uh, that would be a pretty huge bump because you tend to think of, you know, 70 as being the one between the 60 and the 80. And if the 70 is already faster than the 1080 Ti, that's a pretty healthy bump uh, in performance for their upper mid-range card. Uh, yeah, that if, if they had said 1180, then maybe mm -hmm. it's, you know, I'd be more prone to believe it. But just on the face of it, if they said, okay, 1180 is as fast as a 1080 Ti, 
right. but going all the way to 1170, that's just like, wow, if the jump really is that big, uh, you know, well, definitely impressive if, if that's the case also, in the end. But I mean, they're claiming um, 16 gigs of GDDR6 memory, 256-bit uh, memory interface. That's not that big a deal. But they're, they're, the specs are apparently a 2.5 gigahertz clock speed. Uh, which is really fast. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I, you know, it's, uh, you know, I'm curious. Um, it's not nearly. It as, could just uh, be. It could just be a very heavily overclocked 1170 that had benchmarks <laughs> leaked, right? Well, who it knows? Could. We have no idea what the condition of that part was. Um, right. You know, or even, or if it's even legit in the first place. We wait with bated breath. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, stupid fast card. If that's uh, if that's legit. Um, <laughs> yeah. Nice write up. Uh, nice summary. The Inquirer's got a, a sort of collected all of the Intel rumorage. Uh, Jeremy's got a quick summary up on PC Per. Jeremy Hellstrom. Uh, we now have quite a bit of information on Intel's upcoming eighth generation core processors, specifically the Core i9 9900K, the i7 i7 9700K, and the i5 9600K. The i9 will run with eight cores, 16 threads at a base frequency of 3.6 gigahertz with a five gigahertz boost clock, 16 megabytes cache, and a 95 watt TDP. The i7 will run between 3.6 gigahertz and 4.9 gigahertz. Uh, with eight cores, no hyper-threading, with a slightly smaller 12-megabyte cache and the same TDP. Lastly is the i5, six non-hyper-threaded cores running between 3.7 gigahertz to 4.6 gigahertz with nine megabytes of cache and the same TDP, 95 watts, as its two siblings. No idea what the retail yeah, prices are. I feel like they're kind of diluting the i7 a little bit with the whole no hyper-threading thing, but, yeah. You know. Somehow they got to distinguish it between i7 and i9, I guess. Um, if I were feeling rude, I might say that this is a really interesting random collection of choices in response to uh, the affordability of Ryzen processors. But, you know, that may be just me owning Ryzen processors. <laughs> uh, yeah, could be. E either way, you know, uh, higher cores, more competition, good thing doesn't matter which company at this point, yeah. right? Just keep nudging up the number of cores for everybody, which, you know, we need more software, honestly, that takes advantage of uh, of more cores. So you kind of, first you need the more cores to be prevalent. N not the more cores like in the past that's just been, oh, you might have two or four cores in your machine. We're getting to the point now where it's like, well, there's going to be an awful lot of cores doing nothing uh, a lot of the time. Speak for unless. yourself, sir. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> my cores are in use. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness! My uh, my wife kicked it out of the house, uh, but until it was removed from the house, I was actually really impressed with uh, Lenovo's smart display, their tenant smart display. Um, this was interesting. So essentially, uh, it's a Google Home with a screen, or it's a Google Assistant. Um, the bunch of holes on the left is the speakers. And it seems to be a 10 watt speaker with sort of a pair of passive tweeters. The description on it's a little peculiar, but a really good looking 10 inch screen. Um, and it's, uh, you know, you can ask it the usual googly questions, which I will not. Uh, hey, um, yeah, I, I don't want to say it as much as I want to say it because then I'll get everybody's machines at home going and everybody will be upset. But uh, I was impressed at how snappy it was. Uh, Android things running on the Qualcomm. Uh, home hub platform um, and that, there's like an 8 inch version and a 10 inch version and they both run the same Snapdragon 624 um, good looking 10 inch screen you can do HBO now on it but no Netflix no Amazon Prime obviously uh, Spotify integration uh, Deezer and a couple other music services um, it's an interesting product because um, they, they've done some nice things. I mean, part of me is laughing really, really hard because it's like, and it does a great job with recipes. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember in 1978, the Trash 80 did a great job. So mom can digitize her recipes, um, which didn't happen then and it's not <laughs> happening true. now. Um, but what it did do that was really nice is, is you would really, you know, ask it for a recipe for uh, spaghetti carbonara. 
and it would give you three or four options. You could pick one, and then it would reformat the information from the web page on the display so that it was considerably more, uh, considerably easier to use in sort of a stand up across the room kind of environment. I didn't like asking it to, to tell me the next ingredient. Um, you know, <laughs> hey, blank, next ingredient. Uh -huh. And that was, would get a little unruly. Um, but, uh, you know, I like it better than the Google Home in terms of, of some of the things like it seemed to have more volume options. Um, and it looks like it'll operate uh, in the sense of like because there's a screen, you can swipe down on the bottom of the screen to lower the volume. There's a volume up and down switch on the top, a rocker switch on the top. Then, of course, you can just ask uh, uh, Google to lower or raise the volume for you. Um, not a bad looking piece of hardware. The 8 inch version is gray. The 10 inch version you're looking at now is uh, bamboo. It only operates when you're doing a Google Duo video conference in, in portrait mode. Uh, because if you have a tiny kitchen, it'd be nice to be able to do that. Um, HBO Now looked really good on it. Um, it was funny because uh, a friend of mine was over and was absolutely like, I want this. And uh, at the same time, my wife was going, get it out of the house because um, she's not a fan <laughs> of, of listing things. If, you know, if you're thinking of Amazon's Echo Show, that was at like, you know, it's now a $230 Alexa Bluetooth speaker with a seven inch screen. This is way better than that. Uh, I think it looks better. I think it functions better. The screen's better. The screen's bigger. Um, it's a good looking piece of hardware. Uh, and if you're, you know, it, it integrates with Nest and your other uh, uh, home devices, um, you know, I may sneak it into the garage, you know, because it's kind of where the, the voice... Uh, voice control testing is going uh, so as to maintain uh, a happy a happy familial environment. Uh, music sounded pretty good, uh, at least until you tried to get it up into 30 people stuffed in the kitchen uh, disco volumes, which is not really engineered for. But uh, soundtrack sounded good. Music sounded good. Um, I uh, And, of course, I want more video and audio service integration, which I pretty much say about everything these days. Um, watching videos, pretty enjoyable. Um, you know, navigation, pretty good. Uh, you know, I don't know how many times I can ask something and tell me the weather. Um, uh, but of course there's lots of other questions you can ask. Uh, and if you live in the library and you might be upset about what, uh, is an unvetted choice, uh, you can turn off the microphone. There's a switch for that. And for the video camera, there's a physical shutter, which is something Lenovo has gotten really good about putting on just about all of their products. So 249 for the 10 inch version, 199 for the eight inch version. And uh, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Do you have uh, any A-L-E-X-A or uh, G-O-O-G-L-E yeah, devices? Do, I still do not. Uh, that's not due to, due to any particular like preference or phobia or anything. It's just that I just kind of don't have enough of a, of a need. Like, you know, nothing, nothing has uh, swayed me to like, oh, I absolutely have to get one of these things because of insert reason, right? I'm just, mm -hmm. you know, I'll, I'll, st I'll still just pick up the phone and look up the recipe or I'll just, you know, if I need to order something from Amazon, I'll just order it on the phone or on the PC. So we're not there yet, we, not in my household at least. We have a Google Mini in the, in the uh, Hack 5 studio that I'm particularly in love with because you say, hey, blank, turn on hack five lights and that command is tied into several Wemo switches and then all of the studio lights go on at once. Um, yeah. Yeah. We actually do is, that a similar thing here in the office. It's we have glorious. A, I forget which one. I think the Philips Hue lights or something in the, as part of the <laughs> overhead here. And we just, you know, say turn on studio and it does it and it's cool, but it's like the only time we use it is to turn the lights on and off. So, well, you use a Logitech Pop for that, <laughs> which I'm a big fan of. The little Internet of Things button that you can basically click on it or put it next to your door, and you can whack on it as you walk into the house and fire on the home theater or your favorite music or lights yeah. or all of the of interesting thoughts. Next generation iPhone will use Intel modems only. Um, <laughs> maybe, <man. laughs> maybe. So Ookla did testing and found, uh, oh my goodness, what a hot mess. Um, 
there is a, a big performance difference between Intel-based non-Android smartphones, uh, LTE speeds, and any phone utilizing a Snapdragon 845 modem. Quote, the Snapdragon phone showed double-digit gains in latency and triple-digit gains in download and upload speeds, which is going to be fairly noticeable. Perhaps the rumors that Intel will no longer be inside the upcoming generations of Apple phones are true uh, or not. Um, it's really crazy because the, the lawsuit, Qualcomm's basically saying that uh, Apple artificially uh, put the brakes on their products, slowed down their products. Um, so that the Intel and non-Intel uh, modem-equipped phones would have similar performance, and that uh, was considerably lower performance than the Qualcomm modems were capable of. Um, not great news uh, for Intel uh, in a year of not great news. Um, but yeah, it's uh, oh my goodness, yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's a, a pretty good read. Roland uh, more Collier Coy. Collier, goodness, Roland Moore Collier over at, uh, my apologies, sir, over the Inquirer. Uh, it's just crazy. Data for more, quote, data for more than a million user-initiated speed tests, which found the Snapdragon 845 equipped phones have faster cellular speeds and less latency than their Intel equivalents when using T-Mobile and AT&T networks in the U.S. Uh, Ookla uh, did the study or basically did the analysis of the testing uh, and basically said the Snapdragon 845 double digit gains in latency, triple digit gains in download and upload speeds over Intel based non Android smartphones. Um, so, <laughs> ouch. Just yep. ouch. Um, yeah. Uh, it's it's pretty brutal. Um, quote, consumers seeking faster everyday 4G LTE connectivity can buy Android smartphones powered by the Snapdragon 845 mobile platform, knowing that real-world data supports Qualcomm Technologies' claims of superior wireless performance. Um, you know, and Qualcomm's saying this, but the data is... Uh, the data's there for them. It's, it's a pretty brutal uh, series of tests, so... Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the only thing we don't have is that we don't have, like, presumably it would be a newer Intel modem that would go into an iPhone, right? And that's not, that's not something you're going to have a bunch of speed test data right. on, right? The speed test is all existing products that are in the market. Um, yeah. But that's the only possible thing that's that's saving it there, right? Because what all those results say is that as it stands right now, this is what it looks like, A versus B. And in, in this mm -hmm. case, Qualcomm's just trouncing the crap out of Intel. All um, right. Yeah, but, you know, stranger things have happened, right? Like, <laughs> you see someone coming out of nowhere and just suddenly figured out how to make a thing correctly, finally, after failing at it for, for multiple times. It's possible. Well, you know. But, yeah, who knows? We don't, we don't know for sure yet. Yeah, I mean, the other thing they said is, you know, Apple might not even be using Intel by 2020. Um, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's going to get ugly and then it's going to get crazy. Which is why you uh, should try to get yourself a decent night's sleep. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by Casper. Casper, if you haven't heard about Casper, can't believe you haven't heard about Casper. They're an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. If you've ever gone shopping for a mattress, it's a lot like going shopping for a used car. The manipulation, it's crazy, right? The markup on mattresses is huge. So they give you tremendous, like if you go in and haggle with them, right? You gotta haggle with them. You might get a few hundred dollars taken off, but that's still like mattress probably costs, a, you know, a quarter, a third, a tenth of what they're charging you. They do things like tell you like, we'll match, we'll match your price. We'll match the price for this mattress at any other mattress shop. But every mattress shop has its own custom versions. Like, same mattress, just maybe a, a different ticking wrapped around it or a different name for it. It's awful. Casper's revolutionizing the mattress industry. They want to cut the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms, pass the savings on to you. It's a lot less frustrating. Casper's mattress obsessively engineered. This is a nice mattress at a fair price. The original Casper mattress multiple supportive memory foams to give you a sleep surface with just the right sink and the right bounce. 
Plus, its breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulate your temperature through the night. A Casper mattress provides long-lasting comfort and support. You can buy it easily online, and it's completely risk-free. Leo, you saw him there. What was the, the great unveiling, the unboxing, and the floppening, I will call it, when he got his new Casper mattress. If it's been a long time since you got a new mattress, Casper, they got great deals, and they want to give you the chance to really try it out. Free delivery, painless returns within a 100-day period. You don't have to lie down in a showroom and guess, pretend. You don't have to lie down on that mattress that I, you know, it, 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 if you've ever been to a mattress place, you look at those sheets on the mattress, you're like, oh, no. Casper mattresses uphold the highest environmental production standards made in the USA. Free shipping and returns to the USA, Canada, and the UK. Get a Casper mattress today. You can save $50 towards select mattresses by going to casper.com slash twitch and entering the promo code twitch at checkout. That's casper.com slash twitch, promo code twitch to save $50 on select mattresses. Terms and conditions apply. Read them. Do yourself a favor. If 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 you've had the same mattress for like 10 years, casper.com slash twitch. I bet your back's going to thank you. And we want to thank Casper for their support of this week in computer hardware. So did uh, did you hear about the hot MacBook thing? <laughs> did you guys talk about uh, it at PC Per last week? Uh, um, I'm not sure if it I'm not sure if it came up, but yeah, we we definitely been been talking about it in the office for sure. Leo joined us last week on on Twitch, Ryan and I, to, to talk about MacBook hot MacBook Pros running hot. Uh, I was on uh, the new screensavers this week. That was fun, uh, you know, with my laser thermometer. Uh, we ran benchmarks and and look at it and. Uh, uh, interesting article up on The Verge. Um, and so what they're saying is uh, The Verge basically says Apple worked with Lee. They replicated his results. They found a bug, quote, a so-called missing digital key in the firmware. Uh, and that apparently is what is causing the thermal throttling. July 24th, just a couple days ago, Apple released a software update to fix that bug, writes The Verge. Uh, after the software update, they found the MacBook Pro ran quieter, cooler, and faster overall. Some of our premier Pro exports saw improvements as high as 40% faster than the 2016 laptop. Um, this is good. Uh, yeah, and, I mean, uh, this is what happens when your, your power profile is, is correctly applied to your laptop <laughs> as opposed to not correctly apply to your laptop. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, was, there was a bug. It just still baffles me that it takes a person doing a render on a MacBook outside of Apple in order to find a problem that, you know, I am, I mean, come on guys. Like at some point you should take the final product, not with debug, whatever code yeah. running on it and whatever. Like you got to take the thing that's about to get shipped and go in the box and go to customers and do some of the things that they're <laughs> going to do on it and <laughs> see if it does what it's supposed to do, right? Like it's not it's not like a rocket science -y thing. I'm just I'm just shocked that Apple that this kind of a thing would happen to Apple because they tend to yeah, you know, have they tend to have so many different moving parts there that you would figure that they have more polish on their but on the whole procedure of, of how that whole, yeah. you know, release type thing goes down. Uh, but apparently well, not. We've also, but we've seen, I mean, you know, we, we saw uh, a surface book that had miserable, you know, one of the top line surface books where it just didn't have, you know, and who knows, maybe they finally got it fixed. Maybe it had a missing digital key in its firmware. Um, but I mean, it was it was atrocious, and you know, tech support had no fix for it. it was because a friend of mine spent thirty two hundred dollars on a on a Surface Book, and uh, it, the performance was miserable. It was a joke. It was, you know, slower than my core. It was a Core i seven system with more memory. It was slower on uh, handbrake renders than my Core i five system. It was like a year, year and a half old at that point. So, I, I'm glad Apple fixed this. I'm with you for the amount of money they're charging for this. They should be figuring this stuff out before they ship. Um, yeah, but, I mean that's uh, that's one of the major selling points for them is just all this stuff should just work, right? Like, and <laughs> should be and should have the advertised performance without like yeah. headaches and stuff. Um, oh my goodness! But that's you know. But I'm glad they fixed it. And uh, hopefully uh, that'll lead to some sort of, you know, 
maybe there is an extra line in their procedure for, hey, we're about to release this MacBook. Should we test it with the development code on it, or should we actually just somebody test should it with make it hot? Code? Make it yeah, hot. And so should, you know, they, should they should they render some stuff and you know kind of push the system a little bit, make sure it goes full speed? Okay, good. Uh, it works. Now ship it. <laughs> Leo and I yeah. had had a spirited debate about this because uh, he was just so thrilled at how fast it was running Lightroom, and I was just like, "You should be able to render. It should be slowing down." Yes, yeah. it's good. I, I'm actually uh, I'm going to email him and see if he's applied that patch yet. Google uh, YubiKey's got company. YubiKey makes uh, fantastic two FA two factor authentication keys, a physical key like a USB stick uh, that you use. Uh, instead of, for example, getting an SMS message over your phone or running the Google Authenticator. Um, we have we know now it's not being built by YubiKey. I didn't really think it was, but a lot of people were speculating on that. But Google, uh, Google started doing their own internal security key, uh, I want to say like in early 2017, and CNET got hands-on with the Titan security key. That's the name for Google's... Uh, Google's key, uh, you know, which I, I like the description, uses multi-factor authentication to protect people against phishing attacks. Um, but essentially, it's, you know, it's a, it's a 2FA key, it's a security key, um, multi-factor authentication. Uh, and uh, I think it's good. <laughs> if there's going to be a USB version and also a Bluetooth version, which makes me really happy uh, because USB and phones can be such a pain. Um, and uh, 50 bucks for the USB and Bluetooth version and single version USB or Bluetooth for somewhere between $20 and $25. And they believe it will work on anything with a USB port or a Bluetooth uh, connection. So... I wonder if, it, if you get the pair of them. I wonder if you get the pair of them, they both act as like the same key or something. Because <laughs> I could, I could see the situation where you're like, oh, I need, I'm on my phone, I need to use this. Well, right. oh, I can't plug in the USB key, but here's yeah. the Bluetooth one, right? Or reverse, or you know, five minutes later, I'm on my desktop. It doesn't have Bluetooth. I have to plug in the right. USB key, and you're trying to sign into the same thing, right? Like, you know, or mm -hmm. maybe you can just somehow link both both keys to it or something, but it'd be more convenient if it was one, even though having two different <laughs> physical things that are the same key kind of defeats the purpose. Of yeah. The whole I mean, security thing, right? It's interesting because, you know, Google used to use, uh, or Google used to recommend YubiKeys. Um, Yubico, uh, the CEO, uh, Stina Ehrenswald, basically was like, we're not doing a Bluetooth key. That just... Well, uh, the quote is pretty pithy. Uh, While Yubico previously initiated development of a Bluetooth security key and contributed to the Bluetooth Universal Second Factor Authentication Standards work, we decided not to launch the product as it does not meet our standards for security, usability, and durability. <laughs> Basically, Bluetooth uh, is not as secure as NFC or USB. They're worried about the batteries, uh, and they're worried about issues with pairing. So... Yeah, that's uh, fair. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. If you're looking for a 2FA key, you might want to hold out. Um, Shannon carries a couple of Yubi keys. Uh, I know some security pros that use Yubi keys. They're pretty solid. Um, the question is whether or not your 2FA, you have the option in your 2FA for your favorite websites or applications to use that, but a little bit of research, and uh, you should be able to figure that out. But uh, go Google, go Yubi key, secure everything. Secure all the things. Speaking of which, all the things. Um, we were giggling about this uh, a while back uh, because there's so much glass and so many shiny lights. Sebastian actually got his happy little paws on Corsail's Crystal Series 280X RGB tempered glass micro ATX case. Um, it's a sharp looking case. Yes. I mean, I still yeah. tend to do, you know, boxes you can't see into because of the way I route cables. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's 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 a healthy size for a micro ATX motherboard. Lots of space inside of that case. Uh, what was the performance like for it? Uh, I think I think it did pretty well. Uh, the advantage this case has over other micro ATX cases is it's 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 larger than your typical micro right. ATX case because it's it's wider. 
right? So everything's on its side yeah. already, but it has like an extra compartment sort of, you know, on the backside of the, of the, of the motherboard. Um, uh, Sebastian did do some performance testing. Uh, let's see, where did it end up falling in the list there? Um, so the, you get some negative because tempered glass doesn't really flow air very well. So you have right. to rely on, uh, you can see the duct there running along the, that sort of uh, <laughs> most forward edge uh, of right. the case in that picture where, you know, that's, that's basically where your intake air is. So it's not as free flowing, um, you know, so it's kind of, kind of a negative there. Um, but um, as long as the stuff inside the case uh, can still remain cool enough so that its fans don't go spinning up and making the noise levels right. uh, an issue, uh, then it's still going to be relatively quiet, right? But it's kind of a double whammy, right? If you, if you uh, can't get the air in well enough, uh, then even though there's glass, you know, you would think, okay, well, less perforations, it's probably quieter. Mm -hmm. That might actually be the opposite because, again, for the same reason, if you can't get the air in uh, to keep it relatively cool, right. then the internal fans might spin up and it might spin up loud enough to actually make it even past the glass. So, um, but all that said, I mean, it was still decent. It's just that, Yes, if you have a larger, more open air case, uh, it's going to run quieter uh, than this. But you have to pay a little bit for you know the aesthetics of having tempered right. glass in, in all those well, places. I mean, it's, Is it? I mean, when you look at it's also I want to point out you know when you look at the noise levels, um, the lowest noise levels of any of the cases uh, tested in terms of, of like a GPU load, CPU load, um, 47.9 on the GPU load on the uh, NZXT H700i. And the maximum yep. was 56.1 decibels on the fractal design uh, Meshify C. Yep. And, uh, you know, that's on one hand, that's a pretty huge spread, but... Temperature wise, you know, you're talking right around six degrees for the full GPU load. Um, uh, 49.8, 49.6, 49.6 to 57.2. So, you know, seven or eight. Yeah, the seven temperature, or eight, the temperature know, spread wasn't horrible. Um, yeah. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't really like super negative, so to speak. Right. But it was it was near the bottom of the pack. So, mm -hmm. and there's probably a couple of things you can do during the build to try to like maybe make that a little bit better, but mm -hmm. you know, then, then it involves potentially making tweaks to a case that you just bought brand new and right. shouldn't necessarily have to do tweaks on. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. top mounted exhaust, no rear fan, uh, no rear fan mounts. Um, you know, um, it could be, you probably could tweak, you probably add additional fans and, and increase the airflow through it. Um, yeah, but it's not the, it's not the, the, you know, it's, there are more terrible cases out there, but you know, it runs hot, but it's still within, I think it like the max load still within like six degrees of the best performing case on, on the list. But yep, man, those lights, are, those fan light fans are, you're either going to love them or you, you're going to hate them. There's just not much in between. Yeah. Like yeah. I mean, if you get this kind of, you're pretty much getting this case for the luck of it. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, that's, that's right. a lot of, that's what a lot of. That's probably your primary factor for a for a case anyway, unless you're just a person that just needs a case to stick the things in, and you're just going to shove it cases, under the desk and not look at it. I bought cases specifically to reduce uh, noise levels in an office, but yeah, um, they're ugly. <laughs> I'm told yeah. by my yeah, friends yeah. who who have motherboard LEDs that match their fan LEDs, that match their keyboard LEDs, that match the monitor stand LEDs. And, and, the, and the RAM LEDs now. Don't forget those. Oh, my goodness. Unfortunately. So, how many times since Radio Shack shut down have you thought to yourself, <laughs> I need a resistor, I need some solder, I need this weird little part that they used to have in the parts rack at Radio Shack? Uh, at least a few dozen for me personally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I was thinking I'm about not, this. The I'm other. not the average person there, but like, still, it's right. you know, for the for the types of people that need those things, yeah, Radio Shack was like the place, right? Well, it, um, Radio Shack's 
not back, but there's a great article on uh, Hackaday. Uh, Dan Maloney wrote it up. Um, so ARL, ARRL is reporting uh, several other places. They're, I guess they're going to try. There's 147 U.S. locations of Hobby Town. 50 of them are going to get a, quote, Radio Shack Express outlet. So up to like 500 square feet of retail space devoted to electronic components that would be of use to Hobby Town's core consumer base, or excuse me, core customer base, as well as other merchandise and services. Uh, and I'm quoting uh, Mr. Maloney on Hackaday on that one. Um, and they're apparently you know, supposed to do cell phone repairs as well, supposedly. Possibly. You know, I'm just... I just saw the racks. I, I just saw the racks, the drawers with the, the racks of drawers full of electronic components, and, and had a really happy moment. I don't know if there's a a uh, hobby town within a hundred miles of where I live, um, much less one of the you know fifty of one hundred and forty seven hobby towns. But uh, I'm down with that. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I can I could see that right because if you think of like yeah. as Radio Shacks were kind of on their way out, whenever I walked into one. It was typically right. like the, the poor guy's just sitting there twiddling his thumbs all day because somebody's got to run the store. But it's not that often that people are you know constantly going in there and to you know with a need for some sort of well part, times changed right? and Amazon beat well, on that, pretty that's hard. That's true. But. That's true. Yeah, that that's going on also. But if you can if you could justify having the location by also doing some other things right. like cell phone repairs. Oh, they know, tried maybe that. Maybe that's. Yeah, I mean, part of the problem was is like part part of the problem was Radio Shack abandoned its its maker base right about the time the maker movement exploded, and it took them a few. You know, by the time it was, there's a lot of reasons they had issues, but uh, I yeah. I really related to uh, uh, in the hack day uh, write up, uh, Mr. Baloney says uh, it's true that prices were often astronomical compared to buying online. But on a Sunday afternoon, the shack was a lifesaver for that last minute part needed to finish a project, and the premium was well worth the convenience. So, yeah, I mean, we were, you know, we were trying to measure something on LCDs at one point, and I just, I needed a solar cell. Right. So we were trying to, we were trying to turn light into voltage, and I was like, well, I just need a thing that does that. And we didn't have anything around the office, so what did I do? Just drove my happy butt down to the Radio Shack and just picked up a couple. Yeah, they were. Yes, I could have got them on Amazon for, uh, you know, a tenth of the price, but but you weren't going to get them today. I like, <laughs> yeah, I just I just need these right now. Like, and there's a place, you know, a few miles away that I could just get them at. So I'll just go. You know, I wasn't going mean, to stubbornly lucky. not want to pay the premium. We still have fries right. around here, and Jane Co over on the peninsula. If you can actually get to it, but uh, yeah. yeah, I'm. I'm Still a little heartbroken about Radio Shack shutting down. My first soldering iron came from Radio Shack. My first, I think it was an AM radio project. My first soldered together yeah. kit came from Radio Shack, which taught I me a lot about like a, how disappointing making can be. <laughs> yeah. You still have? Oh, I still have a, like, Radio, radio Shack at one point made this uh, proportional temperature, like, digital soldering iron mm -hmm. you know it was like you can just punch in the temperature you want and it would just go to it and stuff right. and at the time like it was like a hundred bucks or something and i bought it like years and years ago and this was when you know like the, you look for one of those today like in retail and it's like hundreds of dollars and like radio shack right. had just this you know super bargain basement price for a thing that I've had it at home for years and have used multiple times. I've used it so many times, actually, that I think the cord is going out on it because I've put it in and out of the box so many times. Uh, you know, that it's just it's just almost done. Like, I've used it to death, basically. Um, You're going to need a bigger box. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My mistake was putting it back in the box it came in, box. which... It, it really was too small of a box for, for that thing. <laughs> You're going to need a bigger box. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's a yeah. quote from Jaws and it's Shark Week. Except yes, it's about I boats, know. not boxes. Yes, yes. You don't say. <laughs> Happy Shark Week. Happy Shark Week. And also to you. Oh, my goodness. Alan, anything you can tease coming up on, uh, coming up on PC Per this week? Uh, we got Any a bunch of stuff going on. I'm not sure on? which. Well, I can't. I can't talk about the secret projects. 
So Sorry. you got that GTX 1170 in, right? Uh, no. <laughs> no. I can say with confidence there are no 11 anythings uh, within 100 feet of me. Because it's a 1270. Because they're going all no. Apple rogue and skipping a number. It's none, of, none of those either. Nope. All right. Good news, <laughs> because they came in and we sold them already. No, I'm just kidding. <sighs> Ooh, I like that thought. PCPur.com is the place to find Alan and his exquisitely dry sense of humor and his extraordinary drive testing results over at uh, PCPur.com. What's that uh, Twitter Twitter location for you, sir? For for me, it's just uh, at Melvin Tano. If you can figure out how to spell my spell my name. <laughs> It's right there on the screen. Just hit pause. And if you're listening to us on audio, right there. at M-A-L-V-E-N-T-A-N-O. And I'm yeah. at Patrick Norton. So. You can also find right. me over at techthing.com, T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G.com, or AVXL. Uh, that's the uh, weekly tech show I do with Shannon Morris. And that's the home theater and audio podcast I do with Robert Heron. And uh, I got to say, thank you so much for listening. And if this is your first episode of This Week in Computer Hardware, do, do us a favor. Go over to twit.tv slash T-W-I-C-H, twit.tv slash Twitch. You get all the download links, all the back episodes. Uh, and, uh, yeah, go there to get all the things, if you would like all of the things to thing on your favorite podcatching thing. To get highly technical. Yes. That, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thank you so much for listening. Alan, thank you so much for coming in for Mr. Shrout. Sure. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Alan Momentano. We'll catch you next week on Twitch. Twitch.